this week on the Back Table Podcast. But, you know, I remember when I saw, you know, how my hand was positioned after the fall mm-hmm. and, and seeing the bone, you know, sticking out of the skin. The first thing I thought is I, I'm not operating again. Wow. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I didn't know the severity of the fracture, but, mm-hmm. you know, I, I thought, well, how am I going to do complex cases and uh, how am I going to provide for my family? And those were the first things that were going through my mind. I hadn't thought about disability insurance or anything, which I had, but, you know, that wasn't on the forefront. It was what was my livelihood going to be? Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. Take an easier way in with the Ellipsis Vascular Access System. Learn more about their minimally invasive option for AV fistula creation, how it could benefit your patients, and important risk information at medtronic.com slash ellipsis. RADPAD was developed by physicians for physicians, clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RADPAD radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the back table podcast. Now, back to the episode. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Behetti, coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. And my guest today is Dr. Deepak Sudhindra, also known as Dr. Sudhi, interventional radiologist who's starting his own center, 360 Vascular, in Columbus, Ohio. Deepak, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Ali, for having me. It's it's really a privilege to uh, be here. I've been listening to uh, Backtable for quite a long time now. Awesome. Well, before we get started... Could you tell me a little bit about your career thus far? Sure. Uh, As you mentioned, I'm uh, an interventional radiologist, and I've recently moved to uh, Columbus, Ohio to uh, start my own practice. Prior to that, I was at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania for the past 11 years. And uh, there I founded and directed the DVT and complex venous disease program. And prior to that, I uh, completed my fellowship training at uh, George Washington uh, University, and uh, and also was at University of Pittsburgh for for diagnostic radiology, and also uh, did my surgical residency in uh, Washington D.C. So you know I know we'll get into that later, but you know I did switch my field. Cool. Well, that brings me to our topics for today. We're kind of covering two separate topics, but both very important. The first thing we're really going to talk about is recovering from a major injury as a proceduralist. And then later on, we'll get into talking about your switch from from surgery to IR. So let's just jump right into it. Tell me what happened with your injury. So this injury took place in uh, October of 2021. I had actually just uh, left the University of Pennsylvania. It had been just about five days since I I left. Wow, that soon. (laughs) I was was presenting at the... um, Venus and Lymphatic Association meeting in in Denver, and I took my whole family out there, and we actually rented a Airbnb in Colorado Springs, and it was our first night there. I had just put our kids to sleep, and I was going to go get a drink of water, and uh, the lights were off, and I went to go down the stairs, and I went to turn on the light, but I must have somehow missed the switch and uh, took the step at the same time. And I fell down 17 uh, steps. Uh, fortunately, oh fortunately, they were they were carpeted, and uh, you know I did not have a, a head or neck injury. But it it happened so quick, and you know uh, after the fall, I had a um, an open fracture. I had a fracture of my left radius and an ulna. The ulna was you know uh, sticking out. I had uh, separated my uh, left AC joint, and I had fractured the left scapula. Oh, my goodness. Wow, you you pretty much hit every joint in that left arm. My goodness, you didn't mess around. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. And I tell you, to to break the scapula is is difficult. So it, it shows the, the oh. amount of force that was there. Yeah. And immediately after the uh, injury, the paramedic said there was a, a local hospital 
Fortunately, I was with it enough to ask them where the trauma center was. And, <laughs> y- you know, the, the trauma center was about 30 minutes away. And they said, well, we have a hospital, you know, five minutes from here. And I was just looking at my hand and the bone sticking out. And I, I said, you know, what? I, I need a trauma surgeon and there has to be one at a trauma center. So I had them take me to the trauma center. Oh, that's so, that's great that you were able to advocate for yourself there and you were with it enough to do that. Although your 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 wife is a surgeon too, right? So she probably could have, if you were really out of it, she probably could have directed you. Yeah. Uh, my wife's an oncologist actually, but you know, she, you know, she had to stay back with the kids. And so she, you know, I just kind of, you know, went by myself and uh, went to the University of Colorado and, you know, they took wonderful care of me and, you know, reduced the uh, the fracture. But what was interesting on top of this, you know, I got a full body CAT scan uh, because of the fall and I had just uh, woken up from having the, the fracture uh, reduced and the trauma surgeons came in and uh, they said, the CT shows that you have uh, acute appendicitis. No, stop it. It does yeah. not. <laughs> yes. did, did you really? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, wow. you know, so I, 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 you know, I just said, uh, you know, let me. <laughs> Let me see the CAT scan. So they, <laughs> so they, you know, you know, so they showed me the CAT scan, and I could see why they called it acute appendicitis. It, it was, uh, you know, uh, enlarged and fluid filled. There was some stranding around it, but I said, you know, I, I have bigger problems here, right now. <laughs> so uh, we are not taking the appendix out. Just, oh, you know, I, I, I need my arm fixed. So I underwent uh, emergent surgery, <laughs> and uh, so there's uh, plates and screws, and you know, uh, in my left wrist. Oh my goodness. And that was so soon after, you know, leaving your last job and you were far away from home. So you didn't have, I know we all kind of have support networks of doctors we know in our area. You didn't have any of that. Correct. And, you know, I, I think, you know, being a physician always, uh, always helps. But, you know, when you're, when you're by yourself and you don't know the system, that's always uh, challenging. You know, I didn't know anyone in that hospital or, or really anyone to, Absolutely. you know, uh, to call. But you know what I found on on uh, Facebook, there is a uh, physician dads group, and I oh. <laughs> uh, so uh, while I was waiting to go into the OR, I just you know reached out to I, I just made a post, and uh, you know mm-hmm. a few uh, a few guys wrote back and they said, hey, you know we know you know some people there. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. For those of you uh, listeners who don't know, there's a really prolific group on Facebook called Physicians Moms Group. I assume that physician dads group kind of grew out of that, but. Yes. Um, for any young physician moms who are on Facebook, I recommend checking that group out at least. And they offer really good advice. And it's a group of women who are kind of all in a similar situation. So thanks for uh, bringing that up. I did not know there was a physician's dad group. That's great. Yes. <laughs> so then how long were you in the hospital for? I was in the hospital just for about 24, 24 hours and then came back and uh, really couldn't travel for a few days. Um, you know, Obviously, it put a damper on the uh, on the week's vacation, uh, I did not go and present at the meeting, but uh, I, I think it was more frightening for you know for my wife and my kids, you know, because my kids heard the big thud when I you know fell down the stairs, and so they were really uh, really frightened, and you know, so my wife uh, you know kind of you know entertained them for the week while I uh, you know was sleeping from the pain meds. But I tell you the the power of you know, just having close friends, close interventional radiology, a uh, friend of mine, Dr. Brooke Spencer, who's in uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, she had actually invited me to, to come and speak at the meeting. And she was very kind and actually sent one of the nurses from her, from her OBL to help us out for a few days. Wow. Yeah. So that was you know, very kind of her. That's a good friend right there. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Brooke. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit more about the post-injury course you had. I know it's been a few months now. Yeah. You know, it, it's it, it's been quite a year. You know, I've never had any fractures, you know, before. So there was a long recuperation, you know, uh, for the hand. I, I couldn't really move it for about, you know, two months. And then I went through about one year of pretty intense physical therapy and occupational therapy three times a week. I had to pretty much relearn, you know, how to use my hand, how to, you know, make a fist and hold a cup and, you know, all all of those things. And it was, you know, it was, you know, trying uh, many times. And I think the biggest thing was the helpless feeling. I, I just couldn't do a lot. And my wife had to help me a lot and the kids had to help me. And that was hard. Yeah. I mean, if especially if you've never had a fracture before and never been debilitated like that before. 
During those first few days in the first week, you were probably thinking a little bit about your career and, and what it meant for you. Could you maybe step back in time and kind of walk me through your feelings then? You know, it was, uh, as I remember to this day, um, you know, because I have a little bit of PTSD now from going down uh, <laughs> stairs. But, you know, I remember when I saw, you know, how my hand was positioned after the fall mm -hmm. and, and seeing the bone, you know, sticking out of the skin. The first thing I thought is I, I'm not operating again. Wow. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I didn't know the severity of the fracture, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I thought, well, how am I going to do complex cases and uh, how am I going to provide for my family? And those were the first things that were going through my mind. I hadn't thought about disability insurance or anything, which I had, but you know that wasn't on the forefront. It was what was my livelihood going to be? Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, since we started talking about it, could you tell me a little bit about what you had for disability insurance and what advice you have for young doctors who are looking at disability insurance after going through this experience? So disability insurance is crucial. You know, uh, none of us know what the future holds or if you're going to be faced with a disability, whether it's from, you know, an illness that, you know, that comes or you have a, a traumatic injury like I had. I got my disability insurance, uh, a private policy as I was finishing a fellowship, because those are probably when you have the, uh, the lowest premiums compared to uh, when you're in attending. And uh, I've had the same policy since then, and it was vital to make sure that it was specialty specific. Gotcha. And just so just so I'm clear, specialty specific is a little bit different than own occupation insurance, right? It is. Specialty uh, specific means that, you know, as an interventional radiologist, although I'm boarded in diagnostic radiology as well, my main practice 100% of the time is interventional. So if I cannot do interventional anymore, then I would get the disability insurance. Whereas if it's based on your occupation, then they can say, well, you're still a physician. You can do history and physicals. Right, right. You could read diagnostic. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So you might not know the answer to this, but do you have to be uh, in 100% IR practice to qualify for specialty-specific disability insurance? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I would assume that uh, you have to at least be doing the majority of your work as uh, interventional or what you really classify your yourself as. So what was your process? Um, you've had the same policy basically since fellowship. I reckon you haven't you hadn't had to use it yet before that time. So just walk me through the process of activating it and the hurdles that you dealt with. Yeah. So first, I think it's very important to have a private policy. You know, the vast uh, or an increasing number of physicians are becoming employed. And many times as part of your contract, you will have disability insurance through your employer, whether you have both short and long term or just long term. Generally, you know, it, it's offered. And at the University of Pennsylvania, I had long-term disability. Now, that long-term disability pays nowhere near what a private policy does. So you have to read the fine print carefully. And for those who are in academics, your salary often is a combination of the payment from the physician organization of the university, as well as the med school. For example, and I'm you know, just using kind of small numbers, but let's say someone's salary is, is 100000 a year, they may get, you know, 40000 from the medical school and 60000 from the physician's organization. And the disability insurance will pay 60% of one of those two uh, uh, values. I see. So it's it's linked to the part of your contract that's and not necessarily for your whole salary. I did not know that. Okay. That is correct. And it really depends on the institution. So that's why you have to read the fine print. Sure. So yeah, so then let's say you recovered from the basic part of your injury um, and then you wanted to kind of get your disability insurance to kick in. So walk me through how you did that. So I, I called the the insurance company and it had been so long since I'd even signed up for this. I, I didn't even remember my, my limits, but it wasn't immediately uh, apparent, but I did not have short-term disability. You know, so they said um, the disability insurance would not kick in for 90 days. And oh. I said, well, what about short term? They said, you do not have short term. 
And then I realized (laughs) that my short-term disability was through the University of Pennsylvania, but I had already left. So I was just, the accident had happened five days before, you know, I would have, I would have gotten the short-term disability. So I think that's another thing for people to think about if, especially if you are the sole breadwinner in your family, you want to make sure Sure. that you have a a short-term rider on there as well. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Not something you probably think about when you're uh, evaluating it as a fellow, you know, when, which is when you signed up. Right. Yeah. And I thought it would be a pretty slam dunk case because we had the the reports from the orthopedic surgeons and, you know, uh, them telling mm-hmm. that I can't operate. But I actually had to fight the insurance company. They did not want to pay out, even though it was specialty specific. This is where having a title can actually be a little detrimental. Oh, oh tell me more about that. <laughs> They, they asked for my CV, and once they saw that it said founder and director of the DVT program at University of Pennsylvania, they said, well, you have an administrative position. And based on the fact that you have an administrative position, that means that you probably have administrative time, are not practicing medicine 100% of the time. So based on the fact that you can do administrative work, you are not entitled to any disability insurance whatsoever. Wow. Not even not even like, oh, we're not going to pay for part of your salary because that's administrative. The whole thing, yeah. man. Yeah, that's dirty. Yeah. All right. OK, so how'd you fight it? Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> so and, and this is, you know, a very reputable sort of gold class, uh, you know, uh, insurance company. So I, I really had to say, well, uh, look, all of these, you know, uh, positions, you know, it, it is voluntary. I'm not getting paid. And I really don't have any administrative time. I'm operating four days a week and seeing patients one day a week. And they said, prove it. So I had to call you, Penn, you know, get in touch with my chief. And I had to submit my case logs for the past two years, showing how many cases, how many RVUs. And then I said, look, there's no way you can do this many RVUs if you're doing administrative uh, most of the time. And I also had to get a couple letters from other colleagues to attest that I was a practicing physician and seeing patients. And it it, it was really a little bit of slap in the face, but eventually it came through. It probably took me about five months, you know, to get the approval, you know, from the insurance company. So that was was, uh, really difficult to go through an injury, let alone trying to use your benefits. That's definitely scary for me. So- what kind of advice do you have for another, maybe a young physician, perhaps a, a fellow who's looking at their own decisions to buy disability insurance? So the younger we are, the more indestructible we feel that that nothing can happen to yeah. us. <laughs> and I, I think I think it's a I think it's a mistake not to get disability insurance. We've put in so many years of hard work and in, in studying it into our profession, but yet we don't know what the future holds. And, you know, if something happens, you want to be able to provide for your family, you know, or provide for yourself. So I think getting an insurance policy before you graduate when the rates are the lowest is probably the best thing to do. And just make sure you really do your homework and that it's covering your specific specialty. Shop around for for rates. Many residency programs will have an agent come and talk to all the residency folks, uh, you know, in that hospital. So at University of Pittsburgh, you know, a gentleman came and he, he talked to the entire graduate medical education uh, classes about uh, disability and, you know, insurance and the pros and the cons and all the different companies. I remember like uh, at UVA, we, ha- we had like some guy come and give a, like bring us out to dinner and and try and sell it to us. And that turned me off from like, you know, buying it because it felt a little like salesy, you know. But luckily, my husband is, he's an extremely conservative individual, so he made made me get it. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think people ask, well, you know, how how long am I going to pay these, you know, several thousand dollars a year in premiums? And, you know, everyone's going to have their own timeline. You know, I think ideally, you know, if you get to a point where you are financially stable in the sense that if something were to happen, you have enough reserves, you know, that you could survive on your own. Now, for some people that may never happen. And for others, you know, they may get to that age at, you know, to that point at say 55 years of age or or whatever it is, and then you can stop with the, uh, you know, insurance. 
The other thing is, and I didn't know this, uh, but when I was shopping or signing up for disability insurance, I actually signed up for two companies to help bring the premium down. Tell me more about that. So I remember when I first uh, signed up for the insurance, my premiums were somewhere around, I want to say, maybe they quoted 4500 or 4800 a year, you know, mm-hmm. you know, something like that. And I, and I said, well, you know, and I just kind of did the math. And I said, my God, if I were to pay this for the next 30 years, you know, that's a lot of money that I'm, that I'm paying. And then the insurance agent said, he said, well, one other thing that you could do is, so let's say, you know, my policy is for the disability policy, say 10,000 a month. Well, 8,500 is through one company and 1,500 is through another company rather than having 10,000 all through one company. And when I split it between the two companies, it brought the, the rate down to about 3,200 a year. Oh, wow. That's, that's really interesting. I didn't, I, first of all, I didn't even know you could split it that way. And I wonder what the, what the advantage to the insurance companies uh, would be to have it split that way and give you such a, a steep discount on it. Well, it sounds to me, they, you know, the, the higher that they are insuring you for, the, the higher the premium. So they have to, so sure. the company, instead of paying, you know, 10000 a month, they can, they're now paying 8500 a month. So your premium is going to be, you know, uh, lower. The problem with it is it's double the paperwork and double the fight if you ever end up having to use it. And that's, that's what I faced. I had to deal with two insurance companies because neither of them wanted to pay out. Oh. <laughs> At least they were consistent. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, thanks for going into that. I think that's kind of a black box for a lot of folks, myself included. I've never had to really utilize those benefits. And it's, it's good to hear physicians go through their stories um, and explain just, you know, where they ran into trouble with it and what the struggles were and what they learned from it, just so we can all kind of learn from the collective experience. So thanks so much. Yeah. After your injury, tell me what it was like going back into the lab after a year of not operating. It was uh, anxiety provoking, to say the least. Not as much as a doing a complex case as a first year, uh, you know, attending or your first week as a new attending. It wasn't like that. I just, I really, I was more concerned about how was my hand going to feel manipulating a wire and, you know, just doing a complex case, you know, you know, if I had to. But, you know, I, I really eased back into it. I, I'm currently doing uh, some locums work here in Columbus. And the first few shifts were very basic bread and butter cases, uh, chest ports, nephrostomy tubes. It really went fine. I didn't notice anything. My hand was a little, little stiff. I was actually concerned about the lead because with the separated AC joint of the scapula, I, I didn't know how, how my left shoulder was going to feel with, you know, 20 pounds of lead. And uh, I, I, I did okay. And, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of strengthening exercises uh, to improve the back muscles. But I think, you know, that's where, you know, if you've done a lot of cases, you know, previously, then I, I think you're not going to lose the ability to, to do those cases. But as time goes on, then, you know, that dexterity can decrease. One thing that I think people need to keep in mind is, you know, I was out for a year, but if you're out for longer than that, two years, then you may not be able to practice. Oh, just um, based on the credentialing? Yes, because, well, one, I had to, a lot of people asked in the hospital uh, credentialing committees, uh, I got uh, some phone calls from the hospital credentialing uh, uh, members as to why I hadn't been practicing for a year, the nature of my injury, did they feel that I could safely you know, perform a uh, procedure, but then they wanted the case logs and they want case logs over the past 24 months. So I was already out a year. So the one year of cases that they got, there are a lot of cases there. But if someone is out, you know, two years, some of them require that you go back to train. Either you have to do a one year, yeah, a, a one year fellowship, or you have to be proctored for a certain period of time. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't Which, imagine that's hard that. to do if you're working locums. Yeah, to get proctored for your cases because the whole point is you're kind of filling a hole, right? Correct. Oh man, yeah. 
I like personally in my practice, I've you know had to take time off anytime I go on maternity leave. And mm-hmm. even though that's only like two or three months, whenever I come back, that first week I'm back, I'm like, am I going to remember how to do anything? <laughs> <laughs> right, but right. I, I can't, it's it's definitely not like taking a year off, but even anytime you're away from your field, some of my colleagues have said that even when they go on vacation for like two weeks and come back, they're like, oh, I, it takes me a couple of days to get back into it. So yeah, Absolutely. a year a year away from your from your craft is definitely something something that would be anxiety provoking. Yeah. So what I mean, I got to ask, what was your first case back? My first case back was a lung biopsy. Okay, and that was uh, you know, that went uh, that went fine, and you know, the hospital th- that I was uh, working at did not really have any uh, high end cases. So again, it was uh, very bread sure. and butter. But I have to tell you, my fourth day, uh, I was doing locums for the entire week. The fourth day there was a really bad GI bleed, and the mm. the patient had gone into cardiac arrest in the uh, uh, endoscopy suite. And they uh, got him back. They actually thought he had a PE and then ran over and said, hey, can you do a uh, embolization? He's bleeding from somewhere. We don't know where. Oh, I love that call, right? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> he's I, bleeding from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, just bring him in. And he's, you know, and he was, you know, uh, an obese gentleman. And I told the tech, I said, you know, uh, fill the injector with a uh, full strength contrast. And the tech said, we don't have an injector here. Oh, yeah. I've definitely been there before. I was like, what? I was like, you know, what do you mean you have an injector here in the cath lab? And, they, you know, they said, yeah, we don't really do a lot of vascular cases here. So we don't have an injector. So I was like, oh, this is going to be a, a very interesting uh, angiogram. So it was all, you know, so all, uh, you know, hand injections and, you know, could barely, you know, see anything. And, you know, but I, you know, uh, embolized uh, prophylactically a, a left gastric. And then as I was wrapping up, the ICU doctor said, can you throw in a filter because we can't anticoagulate him? And mm-hmm. I said, well, I, c- I can't do a venogram. I can't see anything to do a cavagram uh, here. <laughs> so I asked for IVIS and they said, we don't have IVIS in this hospital. So I asked them if they if they had a red, uh, red marker or red crayon and I selectively catheterized the uh, renals and had them draw on the, uh, you know, on the monitor t- to mark the renals. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's a great hack. I love that. Yeah. 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 And then uh, deploy the filter. <laughs> I, sometimes I think we should do like, a, um, we should do a little series for like, because uh, I work at a lot of small community hospitals too, you know, and it's, it's, it's like that, right? Like you're working with folks who don't do the stuff that you're doing very often. Right. And I'm always interested to hear other people's hacks for like how they get around the standard way that they do stuff. So I like that. Yeah. Just, just, Put catheters in, mark it on the screen, and then you know where to go. Right. That's that was that's a uh, I'm gonna steal that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh man. Well, but the case went well. It sounds like you weren't super focused on your arm on that during that case because you had so much else going on. Correct. Correct. And and you know I walked out of the the hospital feeling really good that day because I I, I had to not only think quickly but I, I just felt that I was I was back in the game. If I could you know get through this you know I'll you know I'll be fine. You know, Deepak, what we didn't really talk about is a little bit of the mental load that it took on you being away from what you love for so long. Could you speak a little bit about that to me? You know, I think that was that was hard, especially when not knowing if I would practice because I, I wouldn't know until I actually got back into the cath lab. You know, how is my hand going to feel? My shoulder? Could I wear lead? You know, that sort of thing. And you know, I'm I'm young, and to feel that hey, you know, I I may have to switch gears and do something else, or maybe not practice medicine, or maybe do you know superficial vein disease, or, or you know something that doesn't require lead. I wasn't prepared for that, so I, I think that was uh, mentally uh, trying. But you know, there was also a silver lining. To this, I feel like in in some ways the injury was a blessing in in disguise. Tell me more. You know, it has really brought my family closer together, my relationship with my wife and kids. You know, when I was, you know, when I was back at UPenn, I was doing a lot of really sort of very complex cases, and I was coming home really late, and it, it really took its toll, you know, uh, on the family. And my kids are six and eight, and they really. If I didn't see them for a week, they really didn't care. And now, you know, I've become uh, Mr. Mom. You know, uh, my practice hasn't opened yet, <laughs> but 
you know, I, I drop my kids off every day to school and we have become so close and, you know, they look forward to seeing me, you know, my relationships have improved. And more than anything, I think I've really seen what my wife has gone through, like being a working mom. I don't think I really truly appreciated the amount of work that any working mom, but when you have a physician wife, you know, all the things that are on her plate because I was just doing my own thing in the operating room. Bravo. It's it's so great to hear you say that. That is awesome. You know, I have taken on some of these responsibilities that I should have been doing before, but, you know, but I wasn't. <laughs> and now I'm like, my God, how do you do this? You know, <laughs> you know, it's just it just kind of gives me that look. So, uh, you know, it has been, a, I think, a blessing in disguise in some ways. Oh, I'm so glad that you could see the silver lining there. And I'm glad that you that's made you appreciate your wife more because, yeah, physician moms are hard workers, that's for sure. And we got to be efficient. We got to be good at what we do in the hospital and at home. And there's oh, just, yeah. just very little space to to mess up. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that from all physician moms everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really I, I, I don't know how all, all, all of you do it. I really don't. Coming back to what we were talking about before, were you able to do any diagnostic radiology during your injury time? I was not. And, you know, I think that's the one thing, depending on your career, I have been 100% IR for the past 11 years. I have not done diagnostic other than CTA, MRA, vascular, ultrasound. And I guess we'll touch upon this a little later. I have never truly enjoyed diagnostic. And I think there is the one thing I did learn that is that it is so valuable to have uh, have it as a backup, as a IR, whether you choose not to practice IR full time or you just say, hey, I don't want to do IR anymore. I think it's great to be able to still provide for your family and do something that you enjoy. You know, so that's the benefit. I have actually, I think coming from from surgery, I always felt that if I couldn't practice IR, I would either do something that didn't require lead, like superficial venous disease. And if I couldn't do that, I probably would leave medicine. I see. Wow. So, okay. So you're like a no DR ever type person. Got it. Correct. That's totally fair. I think, you know, you got to recognize that. That's what's important. You got to recognize it. And yeah, some people are like that. Some people don't mind DR. It's fine. There's space for everyone. Correct. (laughs) Correct. Has this injury impacted at all your entrepreneurial endeavors in Columbus? It put things on hold a little bit, uh, actually for you know for several months. I don't think it stifled them. If anything, it encouraged it even more. I think after having a year to sit and, and ponder about where my life was going to go, my career options, and seeing how my relationship with my children has changed, you know, I said to myself, I can't go back to being employed where... I'm just told what to do. And I said, you know, this is my life. I need to be in charge of my destiny. And the only way I'm going to do that is to be an entrepreneur, although it is very scary. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> well, we, I, you don't have a business background, right? Like you're not a, a secret MBA here during all of your prior <laughs> time. And so you're kind of like, kind of like a regular IR guy who's trying to open an OBL and it's definitely scary. There's a lot. There's a lot we didn't learn about in med school uh, yes. or residency. There's a lot of people trying to take advantage of you. I think mm-hmm. to be totally fair. Yeah. And there's not like a playbook for it either. There's just there's you trying out new things, figuring out what works for you, and then just setting setting yourself up with a practice that that you dream of. That's correct. So, um, any advice? I know it hasn't opened yet, but uh, anything that you'd care to share with our audience about what you've gleaned along the way. You know, I've learned that, you know, you have to, you really have to network well, ask a lot of questions. Physicians as a group do not have a lot of business sense. And I think that that is, you know, something that while it can be a hindrance, just because you don't have a business background, it doesn't mean that you cannot open up your own practice. For those, I think, that are coming from an employed position, I think if you have any aspirations of opening your own business one day, you have to to plan a little bit a few years in advance. What do you mean? Financially or what? Well, financially, that means, you know, saving up money to uh, to start your own endeavor. But also 
It is a political landmine out there. So you have to know how to navigate the politics, but also how are you going to get the patients? And that is, you know, that is going to be key. You know, several people, when they heard that I was opening an OBL, they thought I was absolutely nuts because they said, you have been in Philadelphia your entire career, and now you're in Columbus. Most people who open up an OBL, they do it in their own town where they're already practicing. So they have the referrals. They're just opening up their own, their own practice. But in my case, you know, nobody knows me in Columbus. And so I don't have that referral base. So, you know, that brings a new set of challenges in addition to just opening up an OBL. And I think you have to prepare for that. So what can people uh, do? I'd say the biggest thing that has helped me was to really develop a good reputation in what it is that you do so that patients will want to follow you. Well, so let's talk about that a little bit. You started your website. Tell, can you tell the audience about what your website is? Yeah, uh, my website is uh, gethealthyveins.com. Prior to that, it was drsudi.com. And when did you start that? I started that, I think, 2014, maybe. Okay, quite a while back. Yeah. yeah. But you have, a, you have a pretty prolific following on social media and within the public, basically because of your outreach efforts. Yeah. You know, patient education has always been really important to me. And I think it's something that I'm very good at. But I also saw that I was doing it over and over. So if I saw a patient, the patient would say to me, my goodness, no one's ever explained it so simply. And I would love for you to tell my daughter, can you give her a call as well? And, I, you know, we just don't have the bandwidth to do that. So then I start saying, well, what if I could create videos or blog articles that patients and their family members could read. And that way I don't have to repeat myself over and over. So that's actually how the, the website was, you know, was born. And I asked the university if I could do this, you know, on our IR website and they declined. They wouldn't allow it. So I said, well, you know, I'm just going to do this on my own. And that's, you know, that's how it started. And uh, it was really just for patients who I saw there at UPenn. But what I also said is, I said, you know, I could not have asked for a better decade of career than what I had at uh, UPenn. I, my colleagues and everything were wonderful, and I have learned so much. But I also knew that I didn't know where life was going to take me. I was like, am I going to be at Penn my entire career, or am I you know, going to do something else? And I didn't want patients coming to see me at UPenn because I was at this Ivy League institution. I wanted them to say, you know what? I really like going to see Dr. Sudi. And if he's at Joe's Community Hospital, I'm going to follow him to Joe's Community Hospital. I don't care that he's not there. And that's really what I tried to establish you know, for the past decade. Yeah. You want a following of patients who trust you, uh, who are willing to go where you're going. Correct. I get that. Okay. Well, I'll be excited to talk to you in a few months after you're open and kind of get your perspective. And it's probably going to be a whirlwind, but I, I can imagine you're extremely excited. Yes. Yes, I am. All right. Well, we're going to switch gears for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. We have a few minutes left. I want to talk a little bit about your switch from surgery to IR. So now walk me back all the way to medical school. How did you first choose surgery? And did you have any second thoughts of not going to surgery during medical school? So I didn't have any second thoughts, but I come from a, a line of surgeons in, in pretty much, uh, we have so many physicians in our family, almost every specialty of medicines uh, in our family. So I always say we could open up our own hospital. My father has been a, just a wonderful mentor to me and my father's a uh, cardiothoracic vascular surgeon. And he, you know, he trained during an era where, you know, there was no vascular surgery. So he did everything. He did adult, pediatric, open heart, thoracic, vascular. And I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to do cardiothoracic. And that's why I went into to surgery. And everybody knew it. And I was, I think I was, a, I was a good uh, surgery resident. My research was in cardiac surgery. And I trained at a very busy cardiac hospital. It's a MedStar Washington Hospital Center, you know, which is now part of Georgetown. And it was a very resident, you know, run program. And I was early in my fourth year 
and I was doing a carotid endarterectomy with uh, one of the uh, young cardiac surgeons, and he confused me with another uh, resident. And he said to me, he said, uh, he said, Deepak, he said, you're going into plastics, aren't you? And I said, no. I, I said, I'm going into CT surgery. And I said, in fact, I, I just had my first fellowship interview. And he just looked at me and he said, look, he said, CT has really changed and interventional cardiology has really changed the face of heart disease. And he said, this is not where I envision my career. He said, you know, I, I'm operating on the redo, redo cabbage on an 80-year-old instead of a 65-year-old who's been stented multiple times. And so- Wow. So he, he kind of dissuaded you from, from pursuing the fellowship. Yeah, 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 he did. He did. And, you know, and I talked to my father about it and, you know, he practiced, you know, during sort of the heyday of cardiac surgery and my father agreed. He said, look, he said, I agree, but he said, at the end of the day, you do what you want. But he said, you also have to look at the future of medicine. What is going to be big in your lifetime? And he said, in my lifetime, he said, cardiac surgery was big, but he said, in your lifetime, it's minimally invasive. That's where the whole field of medicine is going. So he said, you know, is there something else in surgery you want to do? And I didn't want to do it, anything else. Oh. <laughs> um, and, yeah, um, that's you know, been your dream for a long yeah, time. And, you know, yeah. we had talked about, you know, vascular. I loved open triple A's and carotids, but I said, you know, as a vascular surgeon, I can't walk into a practice and say, I'm only going to do carotid and diterectomies and open triple A's and I don't want to do anything else. You know, no one's going to hire me for that. So one of the IR attendings there said, hey, look, you know, there's a shortage of IR in this country. And in fact, they've started an accelerated program called the Direct Pathway for surgery residents to get into IR. Now, you won't be able to do any coronary work, but you can get into peripheral vascular if you want. So that's, you know, how I, how I ended up changing. Got it. Well, uh, had you had much, much exposure to IR before that, like as a medical student? Nothing. No. You know, when was I was really just uh, in your residency. Yeah. I mean, when I was trauma chief as a resident, you know, we would take the patients, you know, down to IR and they would do an embolization and you'd, you'd watch a little bit. But I wasn't looking at it from the vantage of maybe this would be my career. But I decided to change, but it was very difficult to change. There were only three direct pathway programs in the country at the time. Do you mind me asking what year was this? This was 2004. Got it. Yeah. So about, wow, almost 20 years ago. Yeah. So this is at 2004 and I applied to all three and they took their own surgery people. So then I said, well, you know, you know, what am I going to do? I, I resigned from my residency program and, you know, they were very, uh, they were very supportive. They were very upset, you know, uh, as well, but they were supportive. But what was I going to, uh, what was I going to do? if I couldn't get into one of these programs. So I figured, hey, you know what? I'll just apply to diagnostic radiology. There, at that time, there were 128 diagnostic radiology programs in the country. I applied to every single one. I only got one interview. Wow. And that interview- Are you going to tell me where? Yeah, that was <laughs> um, uh, New York Medical College in Valhalla, where I went to med school. And uh, Dr. Susan Racklin, who remembered me as a medical student, and she said to me, she said, Deepak, look, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think you should look for a career outside of medicine. And I said, what do you mean? Wow. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, she said, you have used up, she's like, I, you left early in your fourth year, but effectively you have used up four years of GME funding. And radiology is a minimum, you know, four years. And so uh, since you've already used up four years of funding, whatever program that takes you is going to have to pay out of pocket for you. I did not realize that was a thing. So you get a set amount of funding per person. And then if you want to do a second residency or something like that, then the programs have to pay for the, the students outside of GME funding. They may get some funding, but they, they don't get the full amount. And so the, the amount of money they get is dependent on what specialty you pick from medical school. So if you pick internal medicine, they'll pay for three years. So if you pick you know, general surgery, they'll pay, you know, five to seven years, depending on, you know, what your program is. So if you decide to leave, you want to make sure that you do it early before you use up, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a lot of the funding. So that's my, you know, you know, piece of advice to people. So since I effectively used up four years, she said, it's going to be expensive to, to hire you. And a medical student has a better chance of getting accepted than you, which is why I wasn't getting any 
interviews because my board scores were fine. My grades were good. So she said, you know, and I'll be honest, she said, I'm giving you an interview, but we're not going to take you either. Oh, wow. (laughs) Well, I guess I just have to make the finances work. So so at that point, you had you'd left your surgery program already. You applied to every single radiology program in the country, all the DR, the three DR programs or direct pathway programs as well. Yeah. No success. I mean, I can imagine where your head was at then. I was I, I was really distraught because I kept thinking, what did I just do? Maybe I should have just finished out my my general surgery uh, residency. Did I really shoot myself in the foot? But you know, again, there's a, a, a silver lining, and that silver lining was really being friendly to everybody in the hospital because it paid itself uh, forward. And I said, you know, I need to do some research to get into radiology while I'm just uh, sitting around. So I said, you know, the two biggest uh, names sort of in the D.C. area are Johns Hopkins and the uh, NIH. And so I went to the NIH and, you know, asked for a research position and interviewed with a wonderful gentleman who's a friend of mine, Dr. Brad Wood. And Brad said, look, he's like, I can't, I don't have any funding right now. Can you work for free? And I was like, I can't work for free. And yes, you know, my parents would have helped me out, but I was like, I, I can't do this for the next, you know, couple of years. And I actually had had not yet resigned from my uh, residency. And I was in the ER seeing a patient and talking to the ER doc. And she said to me, she said, hey, I heard you're leaving the program. And uh, what are you going to do? And then when I told her, she said, you know, do you have a, you know, a, a, a research position yet? And I said, no. I said, well, I just interviewed at you know, the NIH, but it's not looking promising. And she said, who did you interview with? And I said, you know, I interviewed with this guy, Brad Wood. And she just kind of smiles. And she said, you know, Deepak, Brad's my husband. And I, and I oh, said, stop it. Yeah. And she said, and she said, <laughs> she said you know, I, I go by my you know, maiden name. She's like, you know, let me talk to him. And so I, you know, I was able to get a position there. I spent uh, about a year and a half uh, there. And then you know, again, I said, well, the, the direct pathway was formed because there was a shortage of IR in the country at the time. They were trying to encourage people to go into IR. So I said, let me see if I can create my own program. So I wrote to all the diagnostic radiology programs, all 128. And I said, ACGME has approved the direct pathway program. Would anyone consider taking me as their first fellow? And and nobody responded. <laughs> so now we're, you know, at the Christmas holidays and telling my parents. And, you know, my father said to me, he said, look, why don't you send the email again? Maybe it went to their spam folder or, or something like that. And I said, after the holidays, I sent it again. But instead of sending it from my Gmail account, I sent it from my NIH account. There you go. And 30 institutions wrote back. And wow. Yeah. And UPMC stepped up to the plate and they said, We are not familiar with this. Why don't you come and meet us? So I went to Pittsburgh. I gave them a PowerPoint presentation, showed them all the ACGME, uh, you know, what's required. And they said, Well, you know what? This sounds great. You rank us one, we'll uh, rank you one. And then I matched at uh, wow, UPMC. Wow. That is an amazing yeah. story. Yeah. You created your own I crea- fellowship. I position. created my own fellowship, but there's more. Okay. Three weeks before I was about to start my direct pathway program, I got a call from UPMC saying that they are closing their IR fellowship and uh, they can uh, no longer offer the program to me. Oh. So they said, you know, uh, they would let me out of the contract and I could try to find another position. Or if I wanted, I could stay and do diagnostic radiology because I had matched and it's a legally binding contract. So I did not have to do the intern year. I would do four years of diagnostic radiology and then one year of IR somewhere else. So I was like, well, it's been four years of surgery, you know, a year and a half of research, four years now of diagnostic. And then one year I said, at the end of the 10 years, I said, I'll probably put in the same amount of time had I done CT surgery. But let me just go ahead and do diagnostic radiology since they're willing to take me. So, uh, so that's what I did. Oh, wow. So then you did your four years at uh, UPMC. Correct. And then when it came time to apply for fellowship, 
I was really uh, looking at vascular heavy programs. And um, there really were only a handful in the country. And for, you know, for some personal reasons, I needed to either be in DC or close to Ohio. And George Washington University had a really great IR program, but they did not participate in the match. They only took one fellow a year and they internally filled. So, you know, I was looking at UVA and, you know, Miami vascular, but Miami was too far for me. So I applied through the match. I only ranked three places. Are you allowed to tell me where you ranked? I know UVA was uh, UVA was one of them, and I I forget the other two. I think uh, Miami was on there, but I don't remember the the third one. But you know, but as I was you know waiting for the match, I knew some of the IR attendings at George Washington. One of them uh, was my friend, and it turned out as I was at a coffee shop one day, you know, one of the attendings came in, and um, I was chatting with him and. You know, he said to me, uh, you know, where what I'd put on my uh, match list. And when I mentioned that, you know, I was really looking for a vascular program and that, uh, you know, it's a shame that I couldn't, you know, come there. They said, well, you know what? Our fellow actually decided uh, not to do IR and dropped out. Uh, so we have an open. That's your in. We oh, have man, open, I'm so excited yeah, for you. We have I'm open like position. excited for you in the past. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they're like, uh, can you come meet us on Monday? and just meet the other faculty. So I, I did that and I dropped, I actually dropped out of the match and, you know, assigned with uh, GW. And I was with uh, Dr. Tony Van Brooks, who, you know, is just a phenomenal teacher. And Dr. Sean Serene, who I'm sure you know, he was, you know, he also trained at UVA, Al Chun. And, you know, I really, I really got, you know, a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful training. Uh, Andrew Ackman, he, he was the, uh, the, my other attending and uh, wonderful training. And I got a lot of vascular training, uh, which is, you know, which is what I want. That is so, and it all worked out in the end. Oh gosh. What a, what a fantastic, slightly circuitous story to you becoming an IR doctor. Yes. That is, that's really cool. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that with us. Well, I know I've talked to a couple folks who are either surgical residents or either or medical students who are thinking about surgery, deciding between surgery and IR. Do you have any advice for young doctors or medical students who are thinking about switching? I think I have profound respect for both fields. And, you know, I understand that there are, you know, a lot of politics between all our, our fields, but having trained in both, I understand what surgical training is like. I know what IR training is like. And they're just different skill sets. I don't think we do a good job overall of really educating students on the different fields, you know, out there. And so I think anyone going into a procedural field owes it to him or herself to check out everything, all the different surgical subspecialties and interventional cardiology and interventional radiology, and really see what it is that's involved in that field. Because you may be missing something that may be right up your alley and may be a wonderful career for you. And I think it's important to keep an open mind, you know, even if you feel like me, I I wanted to go into cardiothoracic surgery, but it's also just keeping an open mind to all the different surgical fields that are out there. Because maybe, you know, something else may be of interest to you. And when you're a medical student, you're you're pluripotent. So you can be, you can do whatever you want. And Maybe what you decided to be when you first started medical school might not really fit what you end up being when you graduate. That's true. And, you know, some other things I think we need to look at are not only lifestyle, but I think the future of a specialty, I think, is really important. I don't think we talk about that enough. What is the future of a certain specialty? Where is it going over the next 10, 15, 20 years over that person's career? How much is it advancing? And one way to find that out is to pick up a journal of that particular specialty. So if you pick up JVIR and you read through the table of contents, that gives you a little bit of a glimpse as to what's coming down the pipeline in our field. So, you know, likewise, you know, uh, pick it up for, you know, for any uh, specialty. So what do you say to folks who um, think that IR is basically, all the good procedures in IR are basically going to be taken over by other specialties um, and we're going to be left doing lines, tubes, drains, paras, thoras. What do you think about that? Especially now that you've had your experience as an academic and now you're doing a little bit of locums work too and you see what uh, what community practice IR is like. Yeah. 
So, you know, I, the one, I think one thing that I've, I've also learned that sort of practice where you're just doing, you know, the lines and drains can easily happen, can easily happen to uh, any one of us. But what I think IR, if someone's going to pursue a career in IR, is you really have to think like a surgeon. I've told medical students, there is no such thing as a non-aggressive surgeon. And what I mean by that is surgeons have a fire in their belly, okay? They want to be in the operating room. Some like also seeing patients in the clinic, but if you told the surgeon you can never operate again, he or she would be like, oh my God. Whereas I don't find that in IR as much, you know, that fire, that kind of really go-getter attitude. And that doesn't mean that you can't do diagnostic. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying in the IR portion, it's really being out there. It is, you know, following the patients. It's admitting to your own service. It is doing all the things that the surgeons do. I think, you know, we have to do that as well. What, where I can see something happening with our field is maybe 15 years from now, it won't be IR. Maybe you'll be called an endovascular specialist. And if you practice and treat the patients well, you'll have a thriving career. I used to, you know, when I first started out, would wonder, oh, you know, am I going to have a turf war with vascular surgery or interventional cardiology? And what I have learned is, one, I have learned a lot of things from those other specialties. But I've also learned that, you know, there are good and not so good physicians in every specialty. And I think if you play your cards right and uh, really practice clinically focused and longitudinal comprehensive medicine, that regardless of your specialty, you will have patients, you know, coming to see you. Oh, yeah. And I'm hopeful personally that as we see more of the clinical pathway proliferate in training and the, the students that we're attracting with the specialty just like you said, they have fire in their bellies. They want to be clinicians. They want to follow their patients longitudinally. Yes. So we can kind of kick out the old culture of DR heavy IRs who sit in their chairs and don't do much clinical work. That's my hope. I hope I hope I get to see that during my lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Deepak, thanks so much for being on the show today. Is there any last words of advice you have for our listeners? As far as advice, one, uh, definitely get disability insurance. Consider both a uh, short and long term uh, disability, and I think if anyone has you know any questions, I'm more than happy to to speak to them, and uh, they can reach me on email. Can they? I noticed that you're on Twitter. Can they direct message you on Twitter? Is that another good way yes. to talk to you? Yes, uh, Twitter. You know, a lot of people reach out to me for advice on cases. You know, I'm more than happy to do that. But I think I've had an interesting journey. And I think once you face, you know, challenges in your life, and we all have our own challenges, it makes certain things easier. So even though there is, you know, a lot of challenges and obstacles in opening my own practice, based on my journey so far, I know that things will work out in the end. I'm just so excited to talk to you in a few months after that opens and just see how it's going. Deepak, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon. With support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 